Hello random viewer and welcome to the second part of building an airplane. I almost titled this one waiting for backordered components because due to COVID and other supply chain issues, a lot of time was wasted just waiting for parts to come in. So in the meantime, I worked on the components that I did have parts for. In this case, I had some metal pieces that would work well for the LWA parts. I don't know what that acronym stands for, but essentially these are metal plates that are sandwiched between fiberglass layers between the wing and the wing spar, and they provide a surface to put a bolt through to bolt on the wing. Each wing is held on with three bolts. This process was fairly straightforward and involved referring to the plans, marking the metal to the right size and just a little bit over so that they could be filed down to the proper shape and size, cutting them out to that proper shape and size, and then adding the finish and polishing the edges. From there it was labeling them to make sure that I wouldn't forget which ones were which, and that's a distinct possibility in a lot of my projects, so I have to write a lot of things down. After working on several of these LWA pieces, another housekeeping item was my workbench. It was very small, very wobbly, and just was not getting the job done. So we upgraded to this much larger 4x9 foot table, and it provided a much more stable mount for the bench vise, and that allowed me to continue working on the metal parts after I ran out of time with my friend Trevor. For those of you who remember when I tried to dabble in building a rocket engine, it was Trevor and his father who helped build that engine bell and combustion chamber with the brazing technique of melting metal. So I do need to thank Trevor for helping with another project of mine. Uh, this one, hopefully a little bit more successful than the rocket engine. Anyways, he was indispensable in showing me how to properly work with aluminum and getting me a very good start on some of the metal strips and pieces I would need. After somewhere between probably four or six months of waiting, a large shipment of aircraft parts finally became available, and among these were some of the foam blocks necessary to build the fuselage sides, and this is where I really turned my attention. Before I go into too much detail there, I have yet another friend to thank, and that would be Tom Brink, who very generously provided the services of a vehicle large enough to carry such a shipment from the facility down in Atlanta, and drove it with me all the way back up to Greenville, South Carolina in a day. Returning to those fuselage sides, they start life as a 2 by 8 foot piece of foam. I finally found a good use for my chainmail, and that is weighing down the foam so it doesn't move while it's being cut. So I drew the line to trim it down to a slightly narrower width, and then from there cut it, sanded it, and got it to the width that the plans called for, at least for getting started. This particular variety of foam is extraordinarily fragile and very easy to ding up, so I had to be very careful with even the tape measure, or it would put indents in it, and even picking it up with my hands would do the same thing. The next step was using this table that I made using the ratios that were called for for the epoxy hardener and resin to prepare the desired weight of epoxy for joining together a larger piece of foam and a smaller piece of foam to get the length that the plans now call for. After matching the correct weight of hardener, we then pump in the actual epoxy and get the weight to exactly what that table displays or as close as it can possibly get, and then stir it for a solid minute. And then we start mixing in what are called micro balloons. These are microscopic bubbles of glass. It's a very strange consistency, but it soaks into the foam and helps join it together. So we start with a micro slurry, which is about a one-to-one -one mix of micro balloons to epoxy. From there we use Dry Micro, which is a significantly less dense variety with a much larger amount of micro balloons in comparison to the amount of epoxy. And this is laid on the top of the foam block. You can see how it's laid out here. We lay it down in the middle and then push the two foam blocks together and wiggle them around. This forces the air from the middle out. That way there are no air bubbles between the foam blocks. This method of connecting foam blocks was developed by Burt Rutan along with all of the other techniques that I will be using here for forming the foam and fiberglass. And these can be found in his book which comes with the epoxy kit that can be purchased from Aircraft Spruce. After doing the first fuselage side, I stacked a second piece of foam that I'd prepared on top of the first, separating it with wax paper, and did the same process again. Wax paper is a fantastic material for keeping the epoxy where you want it, and then it can be peeled off later. Uh, I learned the hard way, and we will get to that shortly, uh, that definitely use wax paper, and other materials do not work quite as well. 
with the wax paper removed, it's quite easy to see this very strong joint that is now formed between these two foam blocks. From here, I used a Dremel tool to file down those micro balloons and epoxy to get the correct shape. I highly recommend using a vacuum cleaner to pick up the dust because it is not pleasant when it gets in your eyes, as I also found out. And safety glasses don't really work, so a vacuum to suck up that dust, keeping it very close to the Dremel as it goes, uh, is definitely advisable. And of course, I forgot safety glasses here, but they didn't help much even when I did remember them. Moral of the story, though, protective equipment is important. Those micro balloons are not fun to breathe either, so that's the point of the mask. So, mask and safety glasses, yeah, they're, they're probably best, even though they're annoying. And of course, joining one piece of a foam block to a different piece from a different foam block, they don't line up quite right, so, so I had to sand that down. From here, we are tracing out some of the various flight stations, as they're called, or the acronym is FS. So you might see labels like FS28, and that just means we're 28 inches behind the measuring point, which was picked when the plane was designed. Along the length of the foam that makes up the fuselage side are different heights, and this gives the plane a curve on its underside from front to back. So that's what I'm cutting out here. Also in the plans are contours for adding the instrument panel, the seat back, and just some cutouts in it in the foam blocks that make them go deeper or shallower in different sections. So I copied those over from the plans onto the foam blocks. So Dan Polster is helping me out again. He gave me this router to use. It should help a lot in setting the depth of the foam in that channel that I just marked out. Uh, but one of the problems is this is going to throw up a lot of dust. So. I'm going to see if I can attach the vacuum hose to right about here and have it suck up all of that foam dust, maybe not all of it, but a good portion of it before it can go everywhere and make a huge mess. So I'm going to try to set some of this wire, it's more like a twist tie, around here maybe, kind of twist it on, maybe that'll work. I'll have to undo that when I change the battery, but that should do the job. Yep, that's not getting below the platform, so very good. And if I have that up over my shoulder just to keep it straight the whole time, that should work quite well. And from here, I very carefully used the router and put it down into the foam in this section where the plants call for the foam to be only one inch thick rather than the two inch thick. That is the standard. So this adds a cutout and a contour for cables, electrical wires, and all kinds of other things that run from front to back in the plane, probably even a fuel line as well for the fuel selector. So the router has this spinning bit that is cutting into the foam. It cuts quite well and easily because this foam is so fragile. And I went around the outline that had been copied from the plans and those flight station marks. Of course, the battery that I was using died almost immediately after starting, so I had to undo the vacuum hose, change out the battery, and then start again. Even so, it was worth it. That vacuum helped control the dust exactly as I'd hoped. Now that I have it vacuumed out, we can see that these channels did a pretty good job. There's a few little spots where it went a bit deeper than perhaps it should have, but it shouldn't be too big a deal. We'll just smooth those out, and the fiberglass will do a pretty good job. And also, just a filler that we put down before the fiberglass should fill those nicely. I did this zigzag pattern just to set the depth. I was afraid of going too dense on these because if I tried to do the whole area with that router, there wouldn't be anything for the base of the router to sit on, so it would go too deep. This way, we have a nice even depth, and then I can come in with a chisel, hopefully, and just break out these little sections in the middle of the lines. should be noted that I'm using this chisel upside down. This is absolutely incorrect if you're doing it with wood. But because this is foam, which is much has much less resistance than wood, it's not too big a deal. Uh, I had a friend who slipped and stabbed himself pretty badly with a chisel once. So um, yeah, don't, don't repeat that uh, when he did it upside down like this. So don't bring it at yourself and don't do this with wood. But again, with foam, 
it gets me a really nice even depth. It seems to work in quite well, so I'll continue with this. And so the phase of multiple days of chiseling had begun. It was necessary to go very slowly to remove all of these raised areas, but this was about the best way I could think of to do it. It was the safest way to do it without damaging the foam or going too deep. And it did result in a very smooth, even surface that was almost exactly one inch deeper than the surrounding areas. And that is what the design asks for, so that's what I will do. After the center areas were removed, I switched to a smaller chisel and began removing the areas closer to the edge. I'd kept the router purposely some distance from the edge to make sure I did not go too far into it. So now I've worked it right up to the edge, cut it with a saw at a 45 degree angle, and in some places a different angle, just as the hashed transition area called for, and that was just shifting from the one inch depth to the two inch thickness. And from there it was sanded smooth until I had the exact contours. For some of the more complex curves, I found just using my finger worked quite well. The film's fragile enough that that works, and it's the right diameter to get that complex shape. And so I continued this for quite a while, but then disaster struck. If we go back to the step where I was tracing out the lower contour, there was one point where I stacked the two foam blocks, one for each side, on top of each other, and sanded them to match exactly. I don't have video of that, but it looked something like it did here after cutting. I sanded. And I used this exact method of just holding the sanding block and attempting to get them to match. Problem was, there was nothing controlling whether or not I was square at a perfect 90 degree angle. And so one foam block ended up ever so slightly shorter than the other. After my error in sanding, which ended up making this left-hand fuselage side shorter than the right, I figured I could simply add some material by adding a rectangular plate here to kind of hold in some micro balloons, this filler material, and just fill it out. And this was the plate I came up with, this uh, powder-coated steel L bracket, and that worked quite well, and I thought I could just put some Vaseline down to keep it from sticking, and since epoxy was not going to stick too well, or so I thought, I didn't think anything would stick too well to the powder coating. Uh, I was very wrong on that. The foam stuck very well, and I was not able to get it off, and ultimately resulted in me having to cut off a huge section here, and when I tried to pull on this, this snapped off. So now we're going to have to completely reattach to this. I'm going to have to file it down a little bit, get a smoother surface, and then we're going to have to completely rebuild this forward section starting from about this um, FS28. Well, maybe a little forward of it. But that's a good three inches or so that is going to have to be rebuilt from scratch. And so with about a month of work wasted and now having to be redone, I got back to work and sanded down the broken section, added some new epoxy and micro balloons, reattached that, and then cut out a new section to add to the front. The moral of the story here is just be very, very careful. Take your time, make sure things are square, make sure you're doing it the right way. Yes, holding the sanding block upright by eye was a fast method, but on something like this, it needs to be precise. On other parts of the plane, it is more of an eyeball method where the approximate shape is guessed at, but not here, not with the fuselage sides. This is where many measurements are made from. They have to be exact. So take your time, do it right. And if you do mess up, add the filler material properly. Use wax paper. Do not try out a new method on the airplane. Test it on a scrap piece first. It adds time. It wastes epoxy, which is expensive. But believe me, it is not worth the expense and time of replacing such a large piece. Now, finally, after about a month of extra work, I have the left fuselage side matching up to the right again. So this piece here that snapped off has been reattached with some micro balloon mixed with epoxy. Uh, this area was just low before and that was being patched. And we have this new forward section added. So I cut it off, everything from this point forward. And this is a new block of foam that's been sanded to match the contour of the other one. And as far as smoothness goes, it's very difficult to tell where this seam is. You don't really feel it. You see it, but it's hard to feel. There are a few spots like this that I'm going to have to sand down and adjust with the fiberglass. There are a few more spots that I might have to fill a little bit. But 
it's very close and this gets us back to where we can finally begin fiberglassing. As I mentioned in some of my other videos, this project would not be possible without the help of people like Dan Polstra, Tom Brink, and my grandparents for providing space, tools, transportation, and anything else I need to make this happen. So thank you very much. And of course, thank you for watching. I hope you all have a very nice day.